Welcome everyone to our second in our series of our Flu Fit program. This is Amber Rogers with Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We are pleased to um, introduce Dr. Schlinbaum. He is currently the New York State Medical Director for the Senior Home Health Incorporated, which is a company primarily insuring dual eligible people in Manhattan. Prior to that, he was the Chief of Primary Care Service Line and the Physician Integration at the Summit Medical Group, which is a large multi-specialty group in New Jersey, and the Medical Director of an Outpatient Teaching Sites for Hunterton Medical Center Family Medicine Residency Program. He's been a practicing, board-certified family physician in New Jersey for over 30 years. Dr. Schlinbaum is a recognized leader in our family medicine, family medicine patient-centered medical homes, practice management, clinical integration, and healthcare reform. He is also a past president of the New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Schlinbaum earned, earned his medical degree from New York Medical College and completed his residency at Hundred <coughs> Medical Center <coughs> Family Practice in Flemington. We are pleased to have him present our second in the series of Assembling a Flu Fit Team. This will get you started on the practical implementations of your flu fit program. And um, we encourage everyone to use the chat box generously. Um, you can chat in your questions that we can then review at the end of the presentation for a little Q&A. We are having some technical difficulties um, with our phone lines muting correctly. So if everyone could help us by decreasing their background noise and decreasing their own personal phone um, while the presenter is speaking, that would be awesome. Um, with that being said, uh, take it away, Dr. Schlimbaum. Thank you very much, Amber. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone and let you know it's a real pleasure to be giving this, uh, this uh, program. Uh, about FluFit, which is a very wonderful, innovative program uh, helping the American Cancer Society reach its goal of screening 80% of eligible people for colon can colorectal cancer by 2018. So with that, let me go to the objectives, which is the next slide. Uh, first, I'm going to be talking a little bit of background about screening and screening options. The emphasis will be on trying to have everyone understand that there are a lot of options. It's just it's not just colonoscopy. And if we're going to sell the flu fit program, we want to make sure that the providers are engaged and they have faith in the benefit of FIP testing. So we're also going to discuss discuss the uh, flu fit champion's role and the importance of involving the clinical team. And I will tell you about some resources for implementing the staff training and also talk about barriers and how to address those and putting prevention into practice so that we don't miss opportunities. Next slide. So there are many options available. And a recent recommendation from the United States Preventive Services Task Force identified seven evidence-based options for screening. We want to prevent tunnel vision when it comes to screening. And once again, it's not just colonoscopy. Next slide. Most importantly, everyone agrees the best test is the one that gets done. Next slide. So colonoscopy is not actually the gold standard that many people think it is. It misses about 10% of significant lesions in expert settings. It's more costly on a one-time basis, has a higher potential for patient injury than other tests, and the measurable outcomes vary widely. A recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine may call this into question, however. Colonoscopy may have a benefit when it comes to prevention, uh, which is interesting when we talk about cancer. But the prevention piece of that would be through 
polypectomy, which obviously the other options do not have. But selling colonoscopy can be a tough sell, as the next slide shows. Next. Clinicians have a lot of misconceptions about FIT and colorectal cancer screening overall. This survey of clinicians highlights that. Of the 180 clinicians surveyed, 92% said colonoscopy was highly effective, and only 25% said FIT was highly effective, even though 51% said that colonoscopy wasn't readily available, and 82% noted their patients had financial barriers to obtaining colonoscopy, they still preferred it. This may not be the best study, and there is some ambiguity, but it does point out that we can sometimes be monodimensional when it comes to colorectal cancer screening. And clearing up those misconceptions is very important for selling the FluFit program. Next slide. This is a study from the Archives of Internal Medicine in uh, 2012. There were three arms to the study. One was assigned fecal occult blood testing, one colonoscopy, and one arm was a choice of either. Of the total of nearly 1,000 participants, 58% completed the colorectal cancer screening strategy they were assigned or chose. However, participants who, re who were recommended colonoscopy completed screening at a significantly lower rate about 38% than participants who were recommended FOBT, which was 67%, were given a choice, and that was 69%. It also highlighted some cultural differences. Latinos and Asians completed screening more often than African Americans. Moreover, non-white participants adhered more often to FOBT, while white participants adhered more often to colonoscopy. Next slide, please. And this is a study from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. It was designed to look at DNA stool testing when compared with colonoscopy and FIT testing. Nearly 10,000 people were in the study. And as you can see, this is a great endorsement for FIT 74, which was 74% sensitive for, all, for detecting all colorectal cancers compared to DNA testing, which was 94% sensitive. So FIT is a very reliable test, and given, as we saw, that people want choices, FIT is a very legitimate option. Providers need to know this so they can offer all options confidently. Being confident in the testing is crucial for the success of the FluFit program. So this type of information is important for laying the groundwork. Next slide, please. So this talks about stool test quality issues. And I did want to highlight that an, a one-time office FOBT is essentially worthless as a screening tool for colorectal cancer screening and should never be used. Colorectal cancer screening by fecal occult blood tests should be performed with high sensitivity FOBT, either FIT, and that's what we recommend, or highly sensitive FOBT, such as hemocult sensa. The older ones are, uh, should not be used. And of course, you have to adhere to the program that you choose, and, and stool testing should be done on an annual basis, and all positive screening tests should be evaluated by colonoscopy. And as far as the one-time stool test, old habits tend to die hard, and, and physicians tend to continue to do that, so it's important to uh, let people know that there are a tremendous amount of false positives and negatives when it comes to that. But more important than any of it, if you choose the stool test, if you choose the stool testing route, all positive definite, definite, definitely need to be evaluated by colonoscopy. Next slide. 
So hopefully you can see that high quality fecal occult blood testing and FIT are excellent options. There's no evidence from randomized control trials that one screening test is the best. Based on modeling studies that assume 100% adherence for stool testing and colonoscopy, years of life saved through an annual high-quality stool blood screening program are comparable to a high-quality colonoscopy-based screening program when positive tests are followed up by colonoscopy. And once again, emphasizing that people do like choices. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the FluFit program and preparation and also implementation of the program. Next slide. So why choose FluFit? Many sites use flu, FluFit to begin the process of incorporating colorectal cancer screening into routine practice outside of flu season. But getting started during flu season makes a lot of sense. The recommendations are to, for this to be done annual, so annually. So combining the two is natural. In addition, the flu vaccination season has expanded over the last few years, which makes it even better. So uh, now the vaccination time period is from August to April. So there's hardly a time when this wouldn't be applicable. Next. So in order to get a sense of what resources you'll need to, to, uh, to do this, it's good to do some modeling first. Things to consider when you're doing this, when you're starting up a flu fit program are, are the following. What other office performance improvement projects are going on? How will flu fit be received? Almost every primary cost care office these days has some quality metrics to meet. You need to be careful that the office staff is not overwhelmed. However, almost all quality incentive metrics have colorectal cancer screening and flu vaccination rates as part of them. So you can kill two birds with one stone. You need to know where the people are getting flu vaccinations in your area these days Many people get them at pharmacies and other locations, and you'll need to take that into consideration also. So this, this slide is just an example down at the fourth bullet about some of the modeling that you might do. If you have 300 established patients, for example, about 30% of them will be high risk, so they would not be eligible for this. So that, uh, that takes you down to 2,100. And if you shoot, a, shoot for a flu vaccination rate of 40%, which actually is quite low, uh, you'd, have, you'd need to uh, make sure that you had room or the program could fit 840 people. So probably it's going to be in the 1,000 range or whatever, but it depends on the size of the practice, of course. And the other thing is, you want to know who your advocates will be because that becomes very important in selling the program. Next slide. So it's worth taking time to plan your program carefully. A steering committee can be very helpful here. The committee should be multidisciplinary. You should work on goal setting and diagramming workflows. Input from all aspects of the office operation is crucial. So when you put your team together, selecting a champion to coordinate your efforts is, is uh, one of the most important things. You want to select the team members and staffing levels as permitted uh, within the context of your office. And then you have, you have to work on information about flu shots and colorectal cancer screening and what information is going to be given to the patients information about how to organize the workflow and talking points. And then you also have to start working on record keeping and follow up. Next slide. Choosing a champion for the project is a big decision. The champion should be a respected leader who's had previous experience 
with doing projects like this should be a motivator, a communicator. They should be process-oriented. They should know the landscape, all aspects of the office, and understand the conflicting imperatives of the modern medical practice. They should be able to delegate and keep track of the big picture. Next slide. They also need to be innovative, uh, multitaskers and flexible, be able to uh, be a good teacher and also to set a good example. Next slide. The next step is assembling the team. Members must be willing to devote the time to make this a success. It's, pre it's preferable that they, there be, they would be influential with other office members. They should be from multi, uh, different disciplines within the office. They should be patient advocates and interact well with other staff members and excellent team players. Next slide. Since this is a multidisciplinary program and the whole office will be involved at some level, an overall understanding of how the office functions is critical. Office culture is a term I use to describe how the care is provided. Is it a finely tuned machine with a lot of experience with starting projects or a more chaotic one with less experience or a combination of both of these like most offices? How have previous initiatives fared and what went well and what did not go well? One thing for sure, we know one size does not fit all. Another thing to consider, of course, is the population you're serving. And this needs to be taken into consideration as well. Next slide. Again, planning is most important. Not only is the who critical, but what, when, and where are huge as well. Make sure all elements are reasonable. The emphasis should be on seamlessness within the office. With all the other pressures on busy offices these days, the last thing you need is a project that's unrealistic. So your team needs to spend time working on details. Understanding patient flow is important. How are flu shots given in the office presently? Do you have a flu clinic? How do you schedule those? Is there time to incorporate education about FIT testing as well? And will this affect scheduling? And who will manage this on the front lines? Next, please. Planning for follow-up is essential as well. Remember, the FIT program success is dependent on people getting colonoscopies if they have positives. You need to be prepared to have a fail-safe follow-up system. The American Cancer Society has multiple resources to help you with this. We'll talk about the ACS FluFit implementation guide in a moment. Next slide, please. Elements of a successful program. Obviously, a strong leader is crucial here. You need a commitment from the team members, a commitment from the office staff in general, seamlessness of workflow, ease of implementation, it can't interfere too much with ongoing care, clear goals and opportunities for communication, and ongoing monitoring, documentation, and follow-up. Next slide. Now you're sure to encounter some barriers. Engagement of the staff and providers is, is critical, as we've said. Remember, your folks are already quite overwhelmed. There's a lot being written these days about physician burnout and all the pressures on providers. This is a real thing, and you need to be, be cautious when implementing these programs. There are usually conflicting initiatives, and many offices are still struggling with electronic health record Im implementation and maturation. And uh, this is an area that I haven't mentioned yet, but your workflows, in your workflows, it's important to be sure that 
your electronic health record has the functionality to handle a project like this. It's important to make sure your people know how and where to document findings. This needs to be standardized and reportable for tracking. Everyone must agree. And having said that, you want to be sure you're sensitive to missed opportunities. These happen. There's no getting around it. You have to be realistic. You're not going to have 100% implementation here. So ideally, we'd like to keep the missed opportunities to a minimum. Another thing to consider is many electronic health records have prompts and things that are reminders. And a lot of times, the providers are variable in terms of how they react to them. Uh, some electronic health records, uh, the, the prompts will be hard stops, and other ones will be able to be blown through. So you want to know, you want to have an agreement with everyone and uh, someone who is monitoring and overlooking to make sure that uh, people are not doing it in a variable way. Next slide, please. So this is stages of provider readiness. Having done multiple projects like this in multiple practice settings, I think I know how providers react to new projects, hence my rendition of the stages of provider readiness. Many of you may be familiar with the Kubler-Ross stages of dying. Obviously, it's not that bad. But providers can be fairly resistant to change, especially, especially if you don't plan things very carefully and take this into consideration. So first, it's common to have people deny, the providers deny that they have to do this. They, they may say, they may respond by saying, oh, this is not important to me. I don't have to do it. Next, they may be in the anger phase where they realize that they apparently have to do it but they don't want to do it. And then the next bargaining, OK, I'll do it, but what's in it for me? What other tasks are you going to take away? Then reality sets in. They may be depressed and then ultimately come to acceptance that they need to do this and to jump on board. And if you're really lucky, they have some early wins, and they be, become advocates. That's where you really want to be. Next slide, please. The American Cancer Society Flu Fit Program Implementation Guide is an excellent resource. It provides information such as background, information on colorectal cancer and FIT, patient eligibility criteria, screening recommendations, patient education, guidance on setting up your flu fit program, implementation recommendations and resources, and also some examples of advertising and tracking tools. Next, please. So this is a uh, flu fit program training. Is, this is another resource. And the objectives for that would be to understand the impact of colorectal cancer and the opportunities around screening for colorectal cancer screening, know the importance of early detection and recommendations for colorectal cancer screening, and understand how the American Cancer Society flu fit program can reduce the risk of colorectal cancer and be prepared to further plan implementation in your health center. Next slide. So this is uh, just a visual of uh, the uh, implementation guide and the website that you can get that from. Next slide. Resources also include multiple studies supporting the evidence for flu fit program. And this can be helpful if your providers or people in the office want to have more evidence regarding the flu fit program and, and whether or not it truly works. Dr. Michael Potter and colleagues from the University of California in San Francisco have put uh, a lot of these studies together, and that can be found on the, uh, at the uh, web address noted uh, at the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. 
So in conclusion, we know that screening is worth it. It makes a big difference for colorectal cancer. And FIT and uh, high quality FOBT are excellent tools. Linking this with annual flu vaccination in your health centers may significantly improve screening rates. Provider and staff engagement is challenging, but a well-planned comprehensive program can overcome those barriers and lead to success. Next. And I want to take the opportunity to mention the evidence-based essentials for increasing screening, even though that is not directly what we're talking about today. But uh, it is important to understand that these are evidence-based essentials. So the first thing is a recommendation to every patient. Next is an office policy. Next is a reminder system, an effective communication system, and then a reliable data collection and follow-up system. These are evidence-based approaches to increasing screening in your office. Next slide, please. And at this point, I, I want to just talk very briefly about a program that actually stems from the American Academy of Family Physicians many years ago, and it was called Put Prevention into Practice. Sometimes it's difficult with people coming into the office with acute problems to talk about things like screening. And so in many of the offices that I've been involved in, we've tried to get providers to do something preventive at each visit. So. Uh, this would be one opportunity to have them work with, with uh, patients. This might be the, uh, the program that they would want to implement. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that we've been doing a little bit in the chat line is talking about what would be some selling points. What what the audience thinks would be some of the biggest selling points for the physicians and the non-invasive part and doing the test at home um, seem to be the the biggest winners. Um, right. Any other comments? Definitely. I, I, I think that those are big winners. However, I would, I think that it's not well understood that FIT, for example, is very, very evidence-based in terms of its uh, efficacy. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, once again, because I was of this mind as well, very monodimensional when it came to colon, colorectal cancer screening, and there would be colonoscopy, colonoscopy, colonoscopy. And uh, clearly, I don't think that uh, years ago I understood uh, the uh, efficacy of FIT. So if you're having trouble selling providers, I think some of the slides that I put up could be very helpful, uh, letting people know that clearly patients want to have choices and they can increase their rates significantly. And so this is, they're not, FIT is clearly not a substandard test. And uh, so, uh, that's the thing, and the other thing that I would recommend is to look at the studies that have been done by, as I saw Dr. Dr. Potter, I mentioned just a little while ago, there are probably 10 studies that show that you can increase your cancer screening rate, uh, colon, rectal cancer screening rates tremendously with uh, the implementation. So I think we all want to do a good job, and this is another uh, really good opportunity to increase the rates. Yes, and I think that um, part of this, this little group that's getting together, I think we need to get those materials and get those posted on, uh, on our website along with this webinar and so that people can download those and present that to their physician champion um, to help again, sell the program and, and make sure that there's a good understanding from a medical viewpoint. I agree. 
does anybody else in the audience feel free to type or even um, unmute your line and just be brave and ask a question live would be great. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so I have a question. I had a particular um, situation where a clinic, we discussed this and their response was they have a really good thing going, their flu shots, the flu season, or the phase that they roll out the flu shots is, um, is very smooth and well done and they would just hate to disrupt that. So I was curious um, how you would respond to that, Dr. Schlimbaum, um, in terms of not being disruptive and really, um, I guess, presenting it as something that would, would supplement and, and make a positive impact. Um, just curious your thoughts on that. That, that plays into a lot of the things <laughs> that I, uh, I was getting at, and that is it has to work in the context of your office. So uh, if that's true, if in fact your flu rates are, are tremendously high and things are going swimmingly well, then you know I would I would have to think you know maybe this may not be the best thing to do, uh, or uh, I would look at it in another direction. Is okay your flu rates are good, but how are your colorectal cancer rates? And as I said before, most offices these days either whether they're in uh, ACOs or whatever, have quality metrics that they have to meet. And I have yet to see quality metrics that don't include both flu vaccination and colorectal cancer screening. So, uh, you know, you could sell it by way of saying, boy, we're really doing well with flu, and uh, so we can do just as well uh, if we, if we uh, uh, engage in the, the flu fit program. So yeah, I think you have to, uh, you have to be careful. You don't want to disrupt the whole office. But on the other hand, it probably wouldn't, I, I don't know how that clinic works, but you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of clinics have actually flu clinic times. And so it wouldn't, it's not too much of a big deal to then add on, incorporate the FIT piece of that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, it takes a lot of planning, but uh, yeah, and, and once again, you have to consider the barriers and the stages of readiness for participants. So uh, not all, uh, you know, physicians tend to get stuck in their ways and, uh, uh, they may not be jumping on board, but uh, I think it would take a really good champion and a lot of influential people in the office to try to say, hey, let's, let's try to beef up our, our colorectal cancer screening. At, you know, on the other hand, if, if the screening is showing that you're up about 80%, then there wouldn't be any reason to do this. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of look at it like, if your flu flu shot season or whatever whatever it's called at that particular clinic is not going well, adding to it could potentially make it more difficult. So the fact that the, you do have such a great process, maybe it would be easier to add to that. But um, thank you, that was um, helpful. Good. And then we have a comment from Colleen. Um, she says, have there been studies to determine how many people are due for colorectal cancer screening who are getting their flu shot? In the events that we participated in, people appear up to date. And I'm not sure if that's up to date with the flu shot or up to date with the colonoscopy. Wow. I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. Could you maybe? Um, I think it's. She's typing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how fast she can type. The pressure's on. <laughs> Hi, this is Courtney Byes. I can hop in. I've actually talked to Colleen quite a bit about this. Um, so I believe what she's referring to is that when they have their flu fit events, that people that are more likely to get flu shots are also more likely to be screened for colon cancer. And so they, they're up to date with their colorectal cancer screening when they come in. 
Oh, that's a good that's a good question. Well, what are the rates? And then you know if the rates are are not acceptably high, yeah. then I would you know I would want to say well we're not reaching our goals here. What do we need to do to in, improve that? And you know there's no reason why you couldn't sell sell flu shots and fit together uh, to the population that's uh, not up to date and try to emphasize how you could do better with that, uh, that, uh, the outlier population and, and strategize along those lines. Any other questions from the group? Yeah, one other question. Um, do you have any advice or experience with flu fit in a pharmacy? Oh, it's a great question. And uh, I don't at, the, at, at my fingertips right now, but I do believe there, there are some recent studies that, are, that are, have been done with that, or at least one. Uh, Maybe, maybe Amber, you, you would have that. I, I don't have it, but, and I'm not sure whether it's in Dr. Potter's or Dr. Potter's stuff. Uh, but I do believe there has been a study done, and yeah, because we know that a lot of people are getting their flu vaccines at pharmacies. Uh, but I see no reason why that couldn't uh, uh, couldn't be implemented there just just as well. The, the, the rub with that is the follow-up uh, for positives, and uh, it, you really have to ensure that the follow-up is being, being done and people are being rooted in the right direction. Absolutely. I think that's where I'm struggling currently just with um, it's one thing to work with a pharmacy within a community health center where there are primary care right there and engaged in it, but um, with a commercial pharmacy it's a little different. So trying to figure out how to engage maybe multiple partners in some sort of project. Right, right. I, it would be really uh, uh, very innovative and interesting to do that, but it does bring on a lot of complications, as you yeah. suggest. <laughs> Thank you. And that might be something that we might be interested in just doing a, you know, a follow-up to, to the Montana and our respective states uh, board of pharmacy. And because I do know that many boards are trying to pass the medication management codes um, that are billable in some states, like MTM, I don't remember exactly what that stands for, um, but that they are trying to get more, the outpatient pharmacies are trying to get more involved in that primary care setting and communication back to the providers. So if we even had a couple of test people that could share their, <laughs> their journey, would be awesome. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, um, Dr. Schlembaum talked of, about the colon cancer um, screening rates often not being at our goal of 10%. And so I just looked up the MIPS um, scoring. And if you actually scored 80% um, on your colorectal cancer screening, you would be in decile 9, which means you get 9 points for that particular quality indicator. Um, and then the minimum entry point um, is three points, and the screening rates for compliance in that area are between 7 and 16 percent. So um, the MIPS benchmarks um, really provide a gauge for how well all providers are doing um, that submit their data through MIPS, and I realize that's not FQHCs. But um, you know, it's a good, good kind of background of, of where we are as a country with the other um, Part B billing folks. It's a great point. So if people cho choose uh, both flu, pneumonia, and uh, colorectal cancer screening, and they wrap those programs in with every immunization, 
I think we really would get a, um, a better response. So any other questions from the group? I don't see anybody typing. Oh, I guess we do. Um, I, I do believe in, in not hanging on to a webinar um, until the very end. Um, so I'm always happy to have a few more minutes back in my day. Um, and Jane says, thank you so much to the doctor. And I would reiterate that. And again, sorry for <laughs> some of the technical difficulties that we've had. Um, and hope everybody has a successful flu fit program. If you have continued uh, questions or post thoughts about additional um, talking points that you would like to be pulled into the next webinar or get down to some nitty gritty real life problems, we are more than happy to try to get the entire um, team of people that that are interested in this to brainstorm and assist one another. So um, put that in the back of your hat and feel free to reach out to myself um, or your particular contact at the American Cancer Society. And with that, we'll let you um, end your day or end this webinar at least. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay, thanks everybody.